Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, we've got everybody muted just to reduce background noise. Uh, you're welcome to turn your video feed off. That can also help improve bandwidth if you have if you're having some connectivity problems. Uh, we recommend watching in speaker view and um, throughout Evan's program. Please feel free to submit questions via the chat and we'll make sure that they get answered um, by the end of the program. Uh, just a quick uh, plug for some upcoming land trust programs. On April 8th, we're going to have uh, Matt Byrne give a virtual vernal pool exploration. Um, on April 11th, we are co-hosting a virtual Eyes on Owls program with Farrington Nature Link. That's a really great up close and personal look at some live owls um, through the screen. And that's very family friendly. And then on April 14th, our on Belonging in Outdoor Spaces speaker series continues. We'll be featuring Evelyn Ritz, who's a visual artist, and she, she does a lot of cool projects. Um, and her particular focus is on marine environments. Um, and then lastly, we'll be starting our spring birding walks, uh, likely at the end of April, um, and still waiting to finalize a few last details for that but we're working to make that a safe in-person experience uh, with, with limited registration. Um, so stay tuned for more information about that in the coming week or, week or so. Um, just a quick update on our pollinator plant kits, which we'll be offering to our members, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the next week or two. Um, that'll be a great selection of shrubs and perennials and grasses that um, as Evan will talk about, are um, included in the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan and will be um, planted on conservation land as well as sold to our members to be planted in Lincoln and um, surrounding communities. Um, so just quickly before we get started and I turn it over to Evan, I wanted to give a, a quick update on our Pollinator Action Plan. We've been we started this project in um, spring of 2020, working with Evan Abramson of Landscape Interactions and Dr. Robert Jagir um, to survey existing at-risk bumblebee and butterfly populations in Lincoln, and then to select a few sites on conservation land to um, create toolkits, um, planting pallets, and maintenance suggestions to improve the functional diversity of those habitats, and then after those, those areas have been planted to look at the results and see if there's been a change, hopefully uh, increase um, resilience of the bumblebee population. Um, so I'd like to just quickly introduce Evan. Evan Abramson is a results-driven designer and planner on a mission to rebuild biologically diverse ecosystems through pollinator plant interactions. As founder and principal, of landscape interactions. He works closely with project partners from nonprofit, private, and public sectors on efforts ranging from regional corridors to site specific designs. In 2020, Landscape Interactions was responsible for designing over 100 acres of habitat installed in the Northeast, specifically targeting at risk bee and butterfly species. Drawing on his diverse experience as a farmer, community organizer, documentary filmmaker and photojournalist, Evan holds a Master of Science in Ecological Design from the Conway School of Landscape Design, certificates in permaculture design and biodynamic gardening. And of course, he is the author of the Lincoln um, Pollinator Action Plan, who, and he'll be talking about that um, today. Um, so without further ado, I am going to uh, stop my screen share and invite Evan to share his screen and get us started. Thanks, Bryn, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I'm really, uh, really happy to be here tonight talking about this project um, because this project has been um, 
over a year and a half in the making. And we're so happy that not only is the plan done, but um, so many properties in Lincoln have already uh, installed plants and habitat from the plan, from the initial um, versions of the plan, which we shared um, last year. So um, the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan is a townwide plan for Lincoln, Massachusetts, but it provides four different toolkits which take unique properties in Lincoln and through ecological site analysis and field surveys of native pollinator species over the last year's growing season by Dr. Robert Jagir, we determined the ideal plant lists and management strategies for these different properties which represent very common landscape scenarios in the town. So the idea is that it's not just a plan, but it's actually site-specific designs that are replicable and scalable, not just across Lincoln, but across the region as a whole. Just wanna mention that this project would not have been possible without the collaboration of the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust, as well as Becology, um, which is Dr. Robert Jagir's organization um, employing primarily citizen scientists to upload photos and videos of native bumblebee observations in order to um, determine species diversity across the state and across New England. And that science is what's driving the designs and the management recommendations in the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan, which we'll talk about tonight. So I like to start with uh, where we are today in this time. We're living in a unique uh, moment in history. The age of the Anthropocene is uh, a new geological epoch which has been declared as a result of human impact to the environment. It's defined by an acceleration of carbon dioxide emissions as well as sea level rise, the global mass extinction of species and the transformation of land across the planet by human development and deforestation. And currently, as many as 30 to 50% of all species on the planet are heading toward extinction by mid-century. This essentially means that we're facing a potential collapse of nature. One million species are threatened with extinction globally, including over half of native bee species in North America. As many of you know, insects are essential for all ecosystems, not only as pollinators, but also as food for other creatures and recyclers of nutrients. At the current rate of decline, we could lose all insects on the planet by the end of this century. And the main reason is loss of natural habitat, as well as insecticides, particularly neonicotinoids. And thankfully, in Massachusetts, we recently passed a law which bans the sale of neonicotinoids in retail establishments, which is a great win because people have been using them without really understanding the impacts. Over the past 50 years in North America, we've also lost 3 billion birds, which is over one in four birds. And habitat loss is, is again, the most direct cause. So you can see the impact across trophic levels moving from insects to birds it's the same issue, loss of natural habitat, loss of natural ecosystems. So what can we do about this? Well, what we propose at Landscape Interactions is to basically recreate nature through design and planning. Farms, conservation organizations, urban and suburban communities and rural communities are our opportunities for expanding regional biodiversity as well as resilience to climate change improving our local food security by building back native pollination systems. As you can see from this chart here on the right, what happens at the lowest level above ground with producers and decomposers is basically pollination and the ability of plants to reproduce through insect mediated pollination, which then affects and enables primary consumers such as birds, deer, other herbivores, amphibians, secondary consumers, including birds like ravens, crows, animals like um, mice, raccoons, all the way up to predators. All of these species need pollination in order to obtain the food in the web of life. 
In addition, the more plant and animal species diversity that exists in a landscape, the more resilient that landscape will be to disturbance. And right now we're really living in a time of great disturbance. If you look around you, everything from flooding, storms, hurricanes, wildfires, that's all forms of disturbance. And whether they're occurring because of rises in carbon dioxide or not, the fact is if we don't have a diversity of plants and animals on the landscape, that landscape may not be able to bounce back after such an event. So why are pollinators so important? As many of you probably know, they're primarily insects in the Northeast that fertilize plants, producing seeds and fruit. Over 80% of the world's flowering plants depend upon animal pollinators. And in Massachusetts, bees alone pollinate nearly half of food crops as well as one third of food grown in the United States. They're vital to creating and maintaining habitats and ecosystems that most animals, including humans, rely on. And some plants have a very specialized relationship with pollinators. Um, they've co-evolved over millions of years, which means that if their particular pollinator species is not on the landscape, they won't be able to reproduce. And the same goes for bees. Approximately 15% of Northeastern bees are pollen specialists, meaning that they only pollinate or visit for pollen a specific genus or species of plants. So when we're designing a landscape or creating a corridor, we like to think about the needs of a native bee because native bees are so important. There's approximately 4,000 native bee species in the United States and over 10% of them live in the Northeast. They do the vast majority of pollination. In a global study looking at 40 different food crops across every single populated continent on the planet, wild pollinators were found to be twice as effective as honeybees in producing seeds and fruit. The average foraging range, which is the distance that a bee travels from its nest site in the Northeast is only between 200 and 1800 feet, although bumblebees do fly farther. 70% of native bees are ground nesting. Most are solitary, meaning that they don't have colonies. And other examples of their habitat include bare exposed ground, twigs, standing dead trees, snags, and abandoned rodent burrows. This here is a diagram from the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan, looking at uh, two types of properties in the community where pollinator habitat was already installed and the proximity between those sites and other sites. So as you can see here, bumblebees have a much greater average foraging range than other native bee species. The more properties in Lincoln, or for that matter, anywhere on the planet that have diverse pollinator habitat installed, the more likelihood there will be of bees and other pollinators traveling from site to site. And that's really what we're going for here. Looking at fruit and vegetable crops, as you can see from this, uh, this diagram, bumbus, which are bumblebees, are the only native bee species that pollinate most major food groups. So they're really important, not just for native ecosystem reproduction, but also for food, food systems. Other significant pollinators include the ruby-throated hummingbird. It's not threatened or at risk, and it's about as adept at pollination as a honeybee. Aphrodite fritillary is one of the target at-risk butterfly species in Massachusetts that we targeted for the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan. They only uh, lay their eggs on native violets, so you need to have violets on the landscape in order to support them, and they're a species of conservation concern in Massachusetts. The monarch butterfly has obviously gotten a lot of coverage in the press. They're facing approximately an 81% population decline globally, and they only lay their eggs on milkweed species. The Dion skipper, which is um, an example of a threatened butterfly species in Massachusetts, uh, only inhabit very particular um, ecosystems, including wetlands and marshes and shrub swamps. So again, you know, depending upon the landscape and the types of plants that grow there, you'll attract a different group of pollinators. Looking at honeybee decline, which is something that a lot of people are aware of, between 1980 and 2005, we lost approximately half of the four and a half million honeybee colonies in the United States. Again, the main reasons are considered to be loss of habitat, pesticides, as well as climate change. However, since 2005, 
honeybee um, colonies have actually been increasing in the United States and stabilizing to levels that predated uh, the 21st century. That has a lot to do with a lot of the funding and support, including research that has gone into honeybee uh, populations. However, be, in a five-year period between 2010 and 2015, wild bees in the United States dropped in abundance by 23%. And if you look at this map here, areas that are in yellow had the lowest uh, wild bee abundance across the United States. It's not a coincidence that those areas in yellow are also the areas that are the most developed and that have the biggest industrial agriculture, including the uh, Central Valley of California, the sugarcane growing region of South Florida, as well as the Midwest, the Mississippi River Valley. Now looking here, this is a map from just one year, 2014, of estimated agricultural use of one type of neonicotinoid pesticide. It's not a coincidence that these, these two maps are nearly identical between low wild bee abundance and high uses of neonicotinoids. And it's really important to also consider not just the use of neonicotinoids in agricultural landscapes, but also in developed landscapes like, you know, suburban and urban areas because they are still prevalent there. One of the reasons why Massachusetts recently banned such a use. Could we live in a future without bees? Well, this article, this, act this issue actually of the magazine of the Royal Geographical Society of the United Kingdom looked at this and what they found was that according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, 90% of the world's food supply comes from roughly 100 food crops species. 71 of those crops rely specifically on bees for pollination. So that's 64% of the global food supply. And around 270 species of wild bees do the bulk of this work. So regardless of what efforts are underway to create genetically modified bees to do pollination of food crops, as this uh, issue discussed, as well as even uh, mechanical robot digital drone bees that are being developed and patented. It's really wild bees that are doing the bulk of global food pollination. Looking at the impact of honeybees on native bees in landscapes, here's a list of peer reviewed articles that have examined this subject. And I pulled a couple of quotes from them that I'll share with you. A 40 hive apiary residing on wildlands for three months collects the pollen equivalent of 4 million wild bees. What that basically means is that for every honeybee hive that's on a conservation or wild landscape over three months, every hive is collecting the equivalent of what 100,000 wild bees need in terms of pollen. Pollen is reproduction, it's protein. Without pollen, native bees can't reproduce. Local bumblebee decline linked to the recovery of honeybees. Conserving honeybees does not help wildlife. So, it's a difficult subject, but it's one that we really need to talk about. Honeybee hives are not helping in native ecosystems and they're not helping native bees or other pollinators. In fact, they're out competing them for pollen and nectar. So putting more honeybees, honeybee hives out on the landscape is not helping. We really need to support our native pollinators. Most efforts to restore pollination systems. In other words, most efforts to plant pollinator habitat have unfortunately focused on increasing common bee species. Maybe not intentionally, but they're doing that because they're selecting plants that support pollinator species that are already abundant. But there's a lot of other plants out on the landscape. And those are the plants that are unfortunately oftentimes becoming more rare or harder to find not just harder to find in a wild area, but also hard to find in the nursery trade. And those are the plants oftentimes that we're focusing on on our design and planning projects in order to support at-risk pollinators. The reason why these pollinators are at risk is because they're not finding these plants out on the landscape. There's a major misconception about the decline of pollinators. People think, oh, all pollinators are, are in decline. We have to save all pollinators. Well, in fact, some species are actually 
more abundant now than they ever were historically. So seeing lots of bees in your garden or on your property doesn't necessarily mean that it's pollinator friendly. And this video really illustrates that point. So here in this video, you have a long-tongued bumblebee, which is Bumbus vagans, forcing its way into a bottle gentian. And the reason why this bee is able to do that is because it has a large enough body and it has a long enough tongue to reach the nectar reward at the base of the flower. It's not a coincidence that this flower has evolved in such a way. It has done so because it wants to guarantee that this bee will go to another flower of the same species afterwards. This is an example of a specialized pollinator plant relationship. And this is the kind of stuff that we're targeting in the Lincoln. So what's the difference between diversity and abundance? Here you have a map of Massachusetts. You can see that the high elevation areas are in darker orange and gold. The low elevation areas, including Lincoln right around here, are in beige. Historically, these bar graphs in gold, this is how many species were, were on the landscape in pretty high numbers in the Lincoln area, as well as in the higher elevation areas throughout the state. Now comparing that to current levels, which are in teal, there's only in the Lincoln area and widely in lower elevation Massachusetts, Bumbus impatiens is the only species that's really at numbers that are, that are worth mentioning here. You've got a couple of low amounts of Bumbus chrysiacolis, even lower amounts of Bimaculatus. Bumbus vegans is almost zero, as well as Perplexus, Ternarius. I mean, it goes down the list. Fervidus is like almost zero. But look how high those species were historically. And in the higher elevation areas, you have species that historically weren't even there. Now they're in really high numbers because they can't find habitat. So currently in Massachusetts, two out of 11 bumblebee species have already been extirpated. They're no longer found in the state, which is uh, Bumbus pennsylvanicus and Bumbus affinis. Two other species are expected to be gone within the next decade. That's Bumbus vegans and Bumbus fervidus, which are two of the species that we've targeted for Lincoln. We wanna see them stay. We don't wanna see them become extirpated. So what we're doing is we're planting and modifying the habitat to attract those species specifically, species that are at risk. And Mass Wildlife currently has 44 butterfly and moth species, as well as five other bee species, besides the ones I mentioned, as listed at species of greatest conservation need. What one bee or pollinator wants or needs is not the same for every other species. And that's really important at the plant level. Here is a plant list, which was recommended by Xerces for the Northeast. And I'm gonna show you what is not working with this list and why a generic list doesn't work if you're trying to help pollinators that need our help. First of all, there's only one species on this list that flowers before the month of May, pussy willow. It's a great species. We try to include it on most of our sites, but it's a wetland species. So if you're making a plant list that's recommending plants for the entire Northeast, you've got to include more than one species that's gonna flower before the month of May. And you've got to include species that are not just wetland species for that period. Secondly, looking at the late period, all of the species on this list are primarily nectar sources for bumblebees. Bumblebees are a species, or uh, I'm sorry, a genus, that will look, be looking for pollen in the late period in order to get ready to overwinter. So you have to include pollen sources in the late period. Throughout, the, throughout every period, you have to include multiple pollen and nectar sources. At the, um, lastly, this list doesn't indicate if any targeted species are specifically uh, included or if there's any threatened species that these plants are supporting. Other, um, other ecological traps that you would want to avoid if you're creating pollinator habitat is to not plant in areas that are contaminated by pesticides or that don't have an adequate buffer from areas that are sprayed. You want to plant only native plants. Cultivars, hybrids, and non-native plants largely don't support threatened pollinators. You want to make sure your plants and seeds are coming from a clean, pesticide-free source, whether it's a seed supplier or a nursery. So now we're going to dive in a bit to the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan. I'll walk you through it, as well as some of the design sites. 
So we, we start off by looking at the town of Lincoln. And you can see here, these are our four case study sites. We've got the Birches School, Chapman Pasture, Upper Browning Fields, and People for Pollinators. These sites were selected for a couple of reasons. First of all, the owners of the sites were willing to modify not only their management of the landscape, but also what they're able to plant to support pollinators. So in the case of Chapman Pasture and People for Pollinators, those are sites that are owned and managed by the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust. In the case of the Birches School, the school was on board to do pollinator habitat, so we did a design for them. And Upper Browning Fields is uh, managed by and owned by the Town Conservation Department, and they're also willing to change their management of the site. And what those four sites translated in is to um, the People for Pollinator site was our meadow and woodland toolkit. In other words, it's an example of meadow and woodland edge habitat for at-risk pollinators. Chapman Pasture um, is an example of an old field site. It's a site that used to be grazed for sheep for over 40 years, and it's a large site over eight acres. Um, Upper Browning Fields is a wet meadow complex. It's also priority habitat according to nat natural heritage. So we created a design and management plan for those considerations. And the Birches School is really looking at opportunities in a garden or lawn landscape. The reason why these sites are so relevant to Lincoln is because Lincoln is over 30% wetlands and it's also got a lot of farmland, whether it's old farmland, retired farmland or currently used farmland. And it's also got quite a bit of developed areas where homeowners live. Science informed the design process for this project. So Dr. Robert Jagir, who teaches at UMass Dartmouth, he's also the founder and director of the New England Ecology Project he looked at all of these sites, the entire 2020 growing season, observing native bumblebees as well as at-risk butterfly species before we determined which were the plants and management strategies that we were going to employ. So this is scientifically based design. It's not just someone coming up with some really great ideas in their head. We're going to measure the impact of the project over a three-year period. It's basically a before and after experiment. What were the pollinator species on the site before we implemented the plants and management changes? And what are the pollinators that are found on site one year later and two years later? This has also already had a huge impact across the region. As a result of the launch of the Pollinator Action Plan last year with an initial design site at the Birches School, 98 planting kits were sold by the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust to homeowners across Lincoln, as well as in neighboring communities, which meant that nearly 2000 plants were installed on the landscape. And these plants were specifically selected to target the at-risk pollinators for this project. By doing so, over 12 towns have already installed pollinator habitat. So this here is a map of Lincoln, we've got our four case study sites. And then here in lighter purple, you can see 43 privately owned properties. They're primarily residential where these planting kits have already been purchased and installed. If you put a 500 foot buffer on each of these properties, representing the average foraging range of a native bee, you remember that map I showed at the beginning of the program, you can see already the opportunities for a pollinator corridor in Lincoln. And this is, as of last summer. These habitats were already partially installed on all of the residential properties as well as on the toolkit sites to a certain extent last year and the rest are being installed this year. So with just a few more sites installing plants and habitat changes based on the recommendations in the plan, you can see how much overlap there will be across the town. As I mentioned, we've been doing baseline surveys Across the 2020 growing season, Dr. Jagir surveyed people for pollinators, Upper Browning Fields, and Chapman Pasture. And what he found was that people for pollinators had a high abundance, a relatively high abundance of native bumblebee species and a pretty high diversity. But they found he found no at-risk butterflies on that site. Upper Browning Fields had high abundance, moderate diversity. Again, that is with regards to bumblebees, not with butterflies yet and Chapman Pasture had low abundance and low diversity. 
And here is the list of target species that this plan is addressing through all of the toolkit sites, as well as the management recommendations. Bombus affinis, Bombus fervidus, Bombus pensylvanicus, Bombus vagans. At least one, if not two of these species are on the red list uh, by the US Fish and Wildlife. I'm not sure of the status of, of Bombus pensylvanicus at the moment. And here you have nearly 30 butterfly species that are considered at risk in Massachusetts and in many cases in neighboring states. As I mentioned, we've got our four toolkit sites. The idea is that these sites represent case studies or model landscapes for these at-risk pollinators. We want people to not only visit them, but to also look at the designs and the plant lists in the plan and replicate them on their own landscapes. And that's the goal of this plan. Here's our full list of recommended plants for Northeastern Massachusetts. This is based particularly on the landscape conditions at the four toolkit sites in Lincoln, but I think broadly speaking, it applies to the region as a whole. So I encourage people to take a closer look at that and to try to get those plants out on their landscapes. And now we'll take a look at the toolkit sites. This is a rendering of the Chapman pasture design, um, an idea of what Chapman pasture could look like in about five years if all of the planting recommendations are followed. So starting with People for Pollinators, uh, it's, as I mentioned, our meadow and woodland toolkit. First, we always start with an analysis of the existing conditions on the site. So the site had been planted for pollinators as far back as 2016. But what we found were that there were a lot of plants that were missing from the landscape to target those at-risk species. So we looked at this meadow area here that's depicted at the bottom and we found opportunities for adding more plants, either by direct seed or plug, as well as opportunities for planting around that area. And here's a map of the People for Pollinator site. For those who don't know it, you go to the parking lot behind the Lincoln Public Schools and you take a trail through the woods and out through an old uh, hayfield until you reach the site. This is our design for People for Pollinators. It contains a couple of different things I'd like to point out. First, the site didn't really have designated mowed paths. It had a couple of areas that were mowed within the fenced area. What we basically designed for was a path that would reach directly to the site, but rather than approaching the fenced in area first, it would approach the left side of the fenced in area where we have a bee ecology research garden that's already been partially installed as of last year you'd see uh, bee nesting strips, which are basically intentionally created ground nesting habitat for native bees. And you'd be able to follow a mode path, a four foot wide mode path, not only uh, to a shed, which provides shade as well as rainwater catchment for the site. The site doesn't have any running water at the moment, but you could also take this mode path through a shrub woodland edge area, which is, um, partially planted. Right here are the existing plants in black and white and all of the uh, new plants which are going to be added this year. And the paths interconnect with the uh, fenced in area inside the, inside the meadow area. Approximately one third of it is going to be reseeded because there were gaps. There were a lot of um, not agricultural grasses and weeds coming in. And um, the fence is going to be lowered to a height of uh, approximately two feet. Right now it's about, um, I think it's seven or eight feet above the ground so that it prevents um, dogs from coming in off leash, but it allows people to really approach the landscape in a more, in a more uh, inviting way and uh, continue on to the existing mode path. This area right here, I'm sorry, um, let's go back a step. This area right here represented a slight um, wet seep on the site. It's a little bit more moisture condition, so we included some of the more um, wetland um, species such as um, shining willow, pussy willow, and um, Atlantic white cedar, which is an important host plant. Um, looking at the old field site, Chapman Pasture, um, as you can see from these pictures at the bottom, as well as our analysis, it's predominantly an open field site, and it's almost entirely non-native grasses. It was great for sheep and sheep uh, got a lot off that landscape for 40 years, but it's no longer being managed for sheep. And so our plan 
is to burn the site through a unique collaboration with US Fish and Wildlife Service. They're going to do a prescribed burn of the site in early May of this year. And we're gonna follow that up with a seeding in this fall of a really wide range of plants which are included in the plan. Here's the design for Chapman Pasture. There's a lot of exposed rocks and boulders on the site. And so what we designed for were basically shrub and tree clusters sprinkled throughout the open meadow landscape. Those are listed here. There's also a wet swale in the site. It's really, uh, it's really got an intermittent stream feeding it and it connects to a forested wetland on adjacent properties. Um, there's um, a unique group of plants that are just for the wet areas of the site. If you look at the plan on page 50 and 51, you'll see a breakdown of all of these plant species and which species are appropriate for the wet swell versus the upland areas of the site. And I do that for every site in the plan. Here is a, a map from the uh, prescribed fire plan that was commissioned by the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust and US Fish and Wildlife Service. We had a um, burn boss, Alex Entrup, write the plan. And the, plant, the site is going to be burned by a crew of highly trained technicians and many firefighters and burn bosses will be on the site. So there's no reason to be concerned. This is going to open up the opportunity for native plant species to recolonize the site. And when we seed it in the fall, we're gonna be using this upland meadow mix as well as this wet meadow mix for the wet swell. All of these plants are specific to those habitat conditions. And here's just an example of um, a no-till seed drill that we hope to use on the site for seeding in the fall. And this right here is a um, detail of what the bee nesting strips look like that we recommend installing on any well draining area that's in full sun to support ground nesting bees. Our wet meadow toolkit at Upper Browning Fields, um, really more than anything, it is a management change. If you look at this map here, this is just mapping existing plant communities at, wet, at Upper Browning Fields without any planting. We've got already a huge wet meadow area with lots of great native species already on site that support native pollinators and pollinators at risk, including button bush, swamp milkweed, meadow sweet, steeple bush, spotted joe pieweed, early goldenrod, other later goldenrods, various native sedges. We even had native yellow loosestrife, which is pretty hard to find nowadays. And that's in this band right here. Right here, Dr. Jagir found Bumbus fervidus, one of our target bumblebee species actually nesting on the site. And so besides all the plants that we identified, including um, meadow willow, what we really designed for the toolkit were changes in mowing and a bit of planting. It's really simple. We have our pink areas here. It's a no-mow zone. We're not gonna mow it. We just wanna spot remove invasives. It's primarily well-established native plants that support at-risk pollinators with quite a bit of glossy buckthorn. And so our management recommendation for the site is to spot burn the buckthorn using a backpack propane torch. In the fall of 2020, we recommended that this area here in um, orange be mowed because there's actually Pedicularis canadensis growing there, which is really important. It's an early season bloomer that supports bumblebees and a lot of the existing ferns, goldenrods and asters outcompete it because they get, a, they get a leg up in the early season and start growing above it. In this fall of 2021, we recommend mowing or brush hogging the areas in beige, but to then harrow rake and, and broadcast a seed mix on them or to seed drill them. And we create an old pasture seed mix specifically for that. We also recommend adding plants from our recommended species list for the wet meadow and along the trail. And to be really careful with the Bumbus fervidus area, nesting area here to leave uh, a no mow area there. And if necessary to not mow lower than 10 inches. And there's a whole plant list associated with that in the plan. For the garden and lawn toolkit at the Birches School, the school was really on board 
to create palmier habitat and they wanted an educational site. So we created basically an outdoor pollinator garden with a um, edible vegetable garden interspersed with it, which is depicted here in this rendering that we created. And this is what the site looked like before anything was installed. And here in September of last year, approximately 160 students, parents and volunteers from the community showed up and they installed our entire design at the site. Well, I'm sorry, they didn't ins install the entire design, but they installed the entire design for this area, as well as a few other areas of the school. Some areas were not available because of COVID. There was outdoor tents for outdoor classes. So the lawn areas are on pause for now, but basically the garden lawn toolkit for the Birches School breaks out this one third of a acre landscape into eight unique areas. Each of them have their own plant list and their own recommendations for the specific habitat conditions, which you can check out in the plan. So what are the opportunities for connectivity in Lincoln? You know, beyond these four unique designs, how can we actually create a pollinator corridor? Well, we created a number of uh, maps in the plan, which are actually breaking down the landscapes in Lincoln based on existing natural communities and ecosystems, as well as current land use. Looking here on the left, all of the properties in yellow are either residential or developed sites based on current land use. Basically, they've got homes on them or commercial buildings in most cases, or they're parcels that contain an open, fully sunny area that is less than 5,000 square feet. Those are areas that would be ideal to replicate either the People for Pollinators Toolkit or the Birches School Toolkit. Here in the middle, all of the parcels that are in gold contain more than 5,000 square feet of open field habitat. In other words, they're predominantly larger sites. A lot of them are farmland or old retired pasture lands. Those are properties that would be ideal for replication of the Chapman Pasture Toolkit. Not just because it's a great toolkit, but because it's looking at how to do this on a larger scale. It's not a garden. And lastly, the properties here in dark green, all of them contain wetlands, open water, or priority or estimated habitat of rare species, according to the NHESP. I will note, these are, these are town-wide analyses at a coarse scale. They're based on state level GIS data there have not been any on the ground analyses besides our toolkit sites. So it doesn't necessarily mean that every single property here has a delineated wetland. It just means that there's a high likelihood that these sites could take some of the wetland species that we recommended for upper browning fields. So looking at the town again, these here in dark pink are all of the properties that were either the toolkit sites or they already planted pollinator habitat planting kits that LLCT sold last year. If each of them, and then, I'm sorry, and then here in um, Lavender are sites that are within 500 feet of one, of one or more of these phase one sites that contain habitat conditions that fit one of the toolkits, as I showed on the previous slide. Now look here at, with all of these properties having a 500 foot buffer, which represents the average range of a native bee foraging, you can see the opportunity for such a great corridor in Lincoln and look at all the opportunities for pollinator habitat interconnectivity. This is just properties that are within 500 feet of a toolkit site or of one of the planting kit sites. Doesn't mean that these are the only sites in Lincoln suitable. We also include best management practices in the plan that really break down how you can best transform your landscape into a supporting place for native pollinators. It's pretty basic, but it's definitely worth reading through. And we also have pretty detailed instructions about how to convert a lawn into pollinator habitat, either by maintaining an existing lawn and inserting plugs and seeds into the lawn or by creating a brand new landscape a blank slate essentially. As I mentioned, we're measuring the success of each of the sites over a three year period. What are the before and after consequences of the habitat implementation and plant lists being planted? 
And we do this for most of our projects, not just in Lincoln, but across the region. I encourage all of you, if you haven't done so already, to download and visit becology.wpi.edu. It's a web app that you can get through your browser on your smartphone or tablet and to photograph bumblebees in Lincoln and throughout the area so that we can have better data. Right now, this is um, bumblebee species diversity across the region from the Beecology database. And we're looking to get more data. So we encourage you to go out there and take videos of bumblebees this year. This is our website, landscapeinteractions.com. You can reach out to me if you have any questions that are not addressed tonight. And I look forward to uh, our conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Evan. That was that was really great. Um, I know I learned a lot and I thought I knew a lot already. So isn't that funny how it always happens? Um, so just as a reminder, um, if you have questions, please type them into the chat and we'll be um, asking them out loud to Evan. Um, so get, get typing. And to start, we already have a few. Uh, this one's from Ruth. Um, she has a small suburban garden with lots of shade and she uses most of the sunny area for vegetables. Um, do you have suggestions for what plants are realistic and would grow in less than perfect spots? Yeah, I mean, with any question along these lines, if you, um, if you download the Lincoln Pollinator Plan on the LLCT website, um, each of the toolkits has a page which follows the design page and it shows the plant list blown up to a larger size. And each plant um, contains a color next to it, representing whether it's for full sun, full sun and part shade, just shade, just dry or dry and moist or just moist. So I broke out each of the designs into those habitat requirements. Um, just to add on to that, uh, I can send a link to the PDF of the document um, along with the program recording. And Evan, do you wanna also mention how they can get a hard copy? I can include yeah, a link so to that too. There's a website where we do um, our printing for the plan. It's called lulu.com, L-U-L-U. -L -U. Um, and if you go to lulu.com and you just search on Lincoln Pollinator Plan, you can order a full color copy of the plan printed with like a really nice, you know, real book cover for about $17. And um, it's, it's almost a hundred pages. So it's a really good deal. It's cheaper than printing it out at Staples or at home. And um, you can see everything there. And we've also got a link to the PDF on the linkingconservation.org website. Yeah, and I can share those links after the program. Um, Nancy asks, uh, she says that a landscaper told her that spraying aromatic oils such as garlic and cedar um, to get rid of ticks and mosquitoes would not harm bees. Uh, do you know if that's true? I haven't researched this, but I have heard that um, cedar oil, if it's sprayed, like when bees are out foraging, it could negatively impact them, possibly by desiccating their exoskeleton. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if Rob is on the call, Rob Jagir, but sometimes he's on the call when I do this and he can answer these questions. If Rob, if you're on the call, let's unmute you. Otherwise, I would assume that spraying anything that's strong, whether it's herbal or chemical, while pollinators are out, so basically during daylight hours on a sunny or moderately sunny day could have an impact. Um, one way to deal with ticks that perhaps would be more guaranteed is to install bat houses or to have, you know, free ranging chickens or guinea hens. I mean, that I know is totally safe. That's what I do. That's a great suggestion. Um, Rob, feel free to jump in if you, if you'd like a uh, question from Kathy in the meantime. She asks, what are the risks, risks posed by grazing deer um, to the pollinator habitat that we're creating and native plants in general as we see uh, real increases in deer populations? 
Yeah, I mean, this comes up all the time, especially in areas that are more developed, such as, you know, Eastern Massachusetts. Nothing is foolproof, but largely these plants are considered to be deer resistant. Some of them are completely deer resistant. Others are moderately deer resistant because they're native plants that deer don't oftentimes browse. But I think during the initial you know, two to three year period where these plants are just starting to establish on the landscape, if you're putting out a plug or a, a stake, if it's a woody species that's going to be you know, woody in the winter, I would cage it. I would put four foot high hardware cloth in a circular shape around it with a T-post. That's what I do um, on my property and on, I recommend that for all my clients. If it's herbaceous, I don't think you really have to worry because those plants die back in the winter and what's going on is underground for the most part. I think once you're past that first three year period, you know, it's pretty safe to leave something like a native rose or a bush honeysuckle or a willow out. If a deer browses it, it's probably not gonna get um, severely browsed and uh, it will bounce back. That's great. Um, Belinda asks, could you describe the bee nesting strips a little bit more? Sure. Um, let me uh, let me go through the go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, so, one second. I'm in I'm in darkness at the moment. So the bee nesting strips again. You know you know if you're on this call, you should be downloading the Lincoln Plan. It's free and it's on the website. But I will just show you right here is the bee nesting strip. And you're gonna excavate approximately four inches of soil and remove all of the vegetation. On larger sites, we recommend a 10 by 20 foot area. This is like something like Chapman Pasture where it's an eight acre site. So we, I think we recommended, you know, maybe one or two of these on the entire site. On smaller sites, like people for pollinators, we recommended about six of these, but we recommend them to be, you know, about four feet wide, you know, two by four feet wide. You, rec you remove four inches of soil and vegetation, get rid of the vegetation, and then replace half of the soil with a mix of coarse sand. Ideally, this would be installed next to native grasses or sedges, which are ideal nesting sites. And you wanna keep that clear of vegetation as long as possible. If it's open exposed ground, if it's, if it's sandy, which it's gonna be because you've mixed it with sand, and if it's in full sun, and if it's well draining, meaning that it doesn't stay wet too long after a rain event, then bees will likely nest there. And that's basically all it takes. That's great. Uh, question from Heather. Um, how do you recommend to best plant for areas where there may be multiple honeybee colonies competing with native bees. Do you recommend planting at all? This question comes up a lot. And, you know, in an ideal situation, you would somehow talk to the honeybee hive keeper and ask them to move the hives. However, honeybees do fly up to seven miles and they on average, I think fly like 1.9 miles. So, it's going to be hard to get away from them. Um, if you do plant a lot of the plants on our list, they're not targeting bumblebees in the sense that a lot of them bloom before honey. I'm sorry, they are not targeting honeybees because a lot of them bloom before honeybees are really active, like some okay. of the willows. Um, with some of the tubular flowers, it's mostly long and medium tongued bees that will be. Um, getting um, the pollen and the nectar reward from those plants. So, um, you know, the idea is that we've specifically selected plants that are preferred by at-risk pollinators. And a lot of those pollinators are long and medium-tongued uh, bumblebees. Hopefully not all of those plants will be decimated by honeybees, but you know, there's really no guarantee. Oh, thank you. Get away from them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, Elizabeth asks, uh, would you be able to re recommend a specific um, early pollen source 
uh, other than Pussy Willow, she has an upland site um, that's not as suitable. Um, and so she's- That would be um, meadow willow. It would be um, prairie willow. It could even be shining willow in some cases. Um, those are all willows that bloom in succession after pussy willow. Um, red bud is also a great um, tree. It blooms in May, so a little bit later, but I've seen a lot of bumblebee diversity on my red bud. Um, and then you could consider some of the host plants like the Atlantic white cedar, scrub oak, um, beach plum. If you're willing to plant something smaller, as far as early blooms, you know, roses are relatively early blooming. Carolina rose and Virginia rose are both tolerant of dry sites. Northern bush honeysuckle. Um, blueberries bloom in May. Um, low bush blueberry is tolerant of dry conditions. Okay, that's great. Um, just as a quick follow up, she asked if there are any annual plants, annual annuals that would yes. fill that. We, um, we recommend uh, jewelweed and um, pasture thistle, field thistle, and swamp thistle. I think those are biennial actually, but who's counting? <laughs> I, know, I know that jewelweed is annual. There aren't a lot of annuals in the native species fratris pollinators group at the moment, but we've got jewelweed and we've got biennials and you know, as Rob's research continues, more will likely emerge. You can always put down some black-eyed Susan. It doesn't particularly support at-risk pollinators, but it's annual and it can fill in a site while you're waiting for the rest of the meadow to establish. It's sort of like a cover crop. Great suggestion. Um, just a reminder, folks, if you have more questions, you can continue putting them into the chat. I've got a couple more here. Um, Tony asks, um, at what temperature do uh, these native bumblebees become active? Bumblebees tend to be the first bees out on the landscape in the Northeast. Um, I've heard them coming out in temperatures in the, in the mid to high 30s, but um, I mean, I know that they are pollinating pussy willow right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had some cold days. Um, Rob, are you there? Yes, yes, I am here. Am I right with that Hi. temperature range? Um, well, once they're established, but they're not out of hibernation yet, as far as I know, I've been looking for them. It should be within the next week. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other bees and butterflies that are out right now. Um, I've, you know, Evan mentioned the nesting. I've seen on my property, I put in some of these nesting strip nesting strips um, I did last year and this year and already I've seen over a dozen nests uh, ground nesting bees and we've seen some butterflies um, already on the willow so um, but the queen bumblebee should be out in the next week they, uh, the, the, the one at risk fervidus won't be out until later and I'd like to say that lupin is an extremely important spring nectar source in addition to the willows for um, vegans and fervidus and, and also host plant for some butterflies. Yeah, I've been scrutinizing the pussy willow at the edge of my field and it's pretty much in full bloom, but I haven't seen a single bumblebee on it this week. No, but it'll be covered. If you look closely, it'll be covered with a bunch of other things. Um, smaller bees are, a lot of them are out already. They get out really early. Rob mentioned uh, lupin. We've got lupin on the, um, the meadow mix for Chapman pasture. Um, and I, I don't recall if it was on the mix for um, people who are pollinators as well, but I really, I really encourage people to just go through the plan and you know, look at each toolkit site, read about it, read about what, what makes that site unique and then look at the plant list and, and look at which plants are recommended for which habitat conditions, you know, with the color coding that I mentioned. And I really, I would really venture to say that it's pretty easy to figure everything out by just reading through those pages. 
try, we really tried to spell it out as best as we can. And um, I just want to mention that none of this project would have been possible without the, um, the, the support of Jane Gruba Chevalier, who has been such an integral component of the project from the very beginning. She was the one who got Rob and I together with the land trust initially um, in 2019. And she really spearheaded this project and has been such a strong voice behind it. And um, she is the best copy editor you could ask for. She gave me, and I will say this publicly, over 300 edits on the first round of the pollinator plan. Some of them were just like a dot, you know, like a punctuation mark or something. But I was really thankful for that because the plan was so much better because of her critical eye. And we really took the extra step of spelling everything out from start to finish, how to prepare the site, how to plant or seed it, and then how to care for it over time. That's great, Evan. Um, and I think just to add on, the final plan is really quite spectacular. Um, so we had we had a question about, um, you know, how do you select a site? And I, I think you kind of mentioned that as uh, to read carefully through the plan and identify which um, toolkit most closely matches your um, property. Uh, a question from Belinda um, asking about partridge pea as a cover crop. Do you have any comments on that? I do a lot of work with uh, solar companies um, where we're doing sites that are like, you know, 10, 20, 30 acres. And I use partridge pea a lot. But that um, does not have an association with the at-risk pollinators in this project. Partridge pea is considered to be um, a pollen plant for pollen specialist bees, um, according to the research that was done by Jared Fowler. Um, there is some this, you know, discussion about to what extent those all of those bees are specialists because he classified them as specialists at the genus or even family level. But partridge pea did fall into that category of being a pollen plant for specialist bees. And it's also a great annual. So uh, I don't, I don't um, shy away from it. It's just that when I'm targeting at-risk bumblebees and butterflies, I don't use it because it doesn't support them. But I think for larger sites as an establishment plant, it's great. That's great. Um, a question from Lori. Uh, could you just briefly talk about some best practices for a fall and spring uh, leaf cleanup? Um, and she says this is in a case where it's not possible to leave the leaves in place. Is there a, a next best alternative? Well, leaving the leaves in place in the fall is the only real way to, to really help. I mean, you can't you can't like rake and blow all the leaves in the fall and then expect to be helping pollinators because quite frankly, a lot of the Lepidoptera are nesting under and amongst those leaves. And um, I know Doug Tallamy goes to great lengths to advocate for that. I've seen a huge difference in my own garden, just two years of not doing any leaf cleanup in the garden beds themselves and just maybe doing a very light blow of leaves on the lawn. And it's amazing. Not only is the weed pressure down, but we had so many great um, pollinators uh, last year. Um, we had a Virginia white, which is an at-risk uh, butterfly. Uh, we had Bumbus sandersoni, which is a rare bumblebee species, all right around those areas that I stopped uh, raking. And so what I, what I start to do, which is what I recommend in the plan, and this has been advocated by a number of people, not just myself, is to wait until you have two consecutive nights in the spring with average nighttime temperatures, at least 50 degrees, and then you can start to remove the leaves. That's sort of like around when it would be safe. But leaves in a, in a garden bed are great mulch. If it's an open lawn area, I wouldn't feel guilty about doing some leaf blowing or raking in the fall because to be honest, those leaves blow around all winter anyway on lawns. 
But if it's in a bed or on an edge, I would leave them. That's really good to know, Evan. Just a quick um, follow up, just for my own <laughs> curiosity. I know some people mulch the leaves right into the lawn in the fall. Is that um, interfering with the, the butterflies, the Lepidoptera, or is that okay to do early on and then leave um, what was mulched? I, right there? I have no idea. I'll just okay. be totally honest. I don't know to what extent Lepidoptera would be, would be overwintering in a lawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like a, like a shortly mowed lawn. The thing about a lawn is, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's usually it's covered completely with vegetation. You know, there's not a lot of exposed soil in most cases. And, you know, the way I observe it, others may not agree, but I see those leaves moving all over the place across the winter. So I don't really see that as a nesting site where I see the opportunities are in like underneath shrubs or trees or in a garden bed where vegetation has died back and you have sort of like these, um, you know, exposed soil areas that are then covered with leaves and then it gets rained and snowed on or in mm -hmm. wooden edges or in wet areas. But perhaps there's particular butterflies and moths that might like to be under a mulch leaf pile in the middle of a lawn as well. I don't think it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, opportunity for future research. <laughs> um, question from David. Um, he had lots of gold digger wasps in his yard last year, um, and he hears that they are good um, pollinators or insects, and is wondering if that's true. I don't know a lot about wasps, I'll be honest. I know that. Um, if you design for native bees, you're also supporting wasps largely. I mean, there might be particular wasps that have very particular needs. Um, if, if Rob has anything to say on that, I think I should step back. But my understanding is that if you create good habitat for native bees, you're also supporting uh, wasps, as well as flies to some extent. Okay, that's good to know. A uh, question from Heather, and I apologize for my pronunciation, is uh, Glachoma hederacea supportive for early native pollinators? Heather, if you wouldn't mind, if you know the common name, um, typing it into the chat, that would be helpful. Uh, ground ivy. I don't, not at risk pollinators. I don't believe so. I mean, there might be other bumblebees that are out there on it. The distinction that we're really drawing here is, you know, like I showed in the in the graph of, of historical versus current bumblebee diversity in Massachusetts, which is based on comparing Dr. Jagir's present data to historical records from the Yale Peabody Museum. We currently have a lot of bumbus impatiens and not a lot of other bumblebees. And so we're really trying to target those other bumblebees because if we just have a lot of bumbus impatiens, we're not gonna have biodiverse landscapes. It's gonna be like a monoculture essentially of bees. And a monoculture of bees means a monoculture of plants over the long term because they're going to favor more common um, or generalist plants like open face flowers, including invasives. A lot of the, the reason, one of the reasons why Bombus and Patience is doing so well is because it is very happy to pollinate invasives. Same with honeybees, you know, knotweed, um, bittersweet, autumn olive. These plants, you know, dandelions, you name it, like any plant that's just sort of out there on the landscape and not really providing, um, ecological functional diversity, most likely they are being pollinated by species that are at very stable populations. And that's why those species are so stable is because they're finding a lot of that. We all know this, our landscapes are inundated with invasive species, weeds and non-natives and, and horticultural specimens and cultivars. You know, what we're trying to do is bring back these um, increasingly rare or less common native plant communities to support the increasingly rare and less common pollinators that depend upon them. And I don't believe that ground ivy is within that plant group. I just say to switch the ground ivy, use Prunella vulgaris instead. 
it's doing this it's the native great thanks rob um, uh, any further questions feel free to keep putting them into the chat uh had a couple questions about the toolkit so the toolkits are the the designs that Evan has created for the four sites in Lincoln. Um, and those are encapsulated in the pollinator action plan. Um, and then also just a few questions about where to purchase plants. We're working on getting that ready and online and we'll be sending an email out to our membership hopefully in the next week or so and a, a wider um, promotion of those plants um, shortly thereafter. So stay, stay tuned for that. Um, but we, we don't have um, quite enough information pinned down to, to open orders, but I am hoping to get um, wild lupin plugs. So that'll be good to get some out on the landscape. Uh, we have another question from Elizabeth here. Um, just wondering, uh, you know, in a more built up, maybe a suburban or urban environment, if you plant a garden, do they really come to it? these, these at-risk bumblebees? Do we know? I mean, that's what, that's what Rob's been studying and that's why we're recommending these plants. He has a number of sites where, you know, in Eastern Massachusetts and elsewhere where he's put in just a couple of these plants and the bumblebee and butterfly observations have, have changed. I mean, he's seen more species, a lot of more of the at-risk species. They, somehow find these plants. It absolutely makes a difference. And what we don't want is honeybee hives on rooftops in cities. Mm -hmm. You know, that is not gonna help. Just because it's developed doesn't mean we should just give it over to whatever. You know, these are landscapes where, despite whether or not we notice them, these native pollinators are out there. They exist and they need our help. We have to put out the plants that they evolved with in order to support them. Otherwise, they're going to be extirpated from developed areas, and they're only going to be in these remote, you know, remote, pristine rural landscapes. And then after that, who knows if they'll even be there? That's what's been going on over the last 30 or so years. I'd like to add to that and just say that you know, obviously in urban areas, it's more difficult, but if everybody put these in, they would expand their range into those urban areas where they might not be otherwise. And so it's, you know, this is a long-term effort. So if you put them in, you don't see them that year. And I certainly, as Evan said, have had a lot of success putting them in, in relatively urban areas, but not, you know, downtown Boston, if that's what you mean by urban. Um, nest sites and overwintering sites become a challenge um, so it's not just about the plants, but, um, you know, certainly in urban areas, you know, I live in Framingham, um, and I've seen results putting them in my yard and my neighbor's yards. So, I mean, I, th I really feel that, you know, this might, this might sound unreasonable, but I think that if you had a concerted effort on the part of citizens and perhaps you know, a parks and recreation department in a city like Boston. And if you strategically planted on sites that were within a close enough proximity to the next site, I think you could create a corridor through an urban area to connect to protected, more natural landscapes that are on outlying areas like parks. And, you know, Boston, you know, it's a lot more vegetated than New York City, for example, where I grew up. And I think that if you, um, if you did, you know, do the right plantings in the right places, you could connect to things like the, um, what is it, what is it, the green necklace, the, um, what's it called? Oh, the, right, the emerald necklace. Emerald necklace, like you could use that and just sort of build to that. And, or even, you know, even things like cemeteries, you know, connecting to those sites across an urban area with particular plants. Maybe you would have a really stripped down plant list and you just try to get the essentials in. But you know, over time, I think it's certainly possible and it's worth trying. Yeah, I, I did get a Bombus fervidus sighting, which is that long tongue bee in 
from Harvard. So, um, you know, it definitely is, they're there to some degree. Someone's asking about if we only recommend planting male willows. Um, Rob, do you wanna talk about that a bit? Right, so if you had a choice males, the males would be better um, because they supply nectar and pollen. Um, so if you don't have pollen, you, you can't, you know, the bees can't make new bees basically is what it comes down to. Um, so you get both with the male willow. So that's why I recommend the, the male uh, willow. Female's still good as a source of nectar, but the male goes both. Um, a question from Lori about, um, can the toolkits be replicated on municipal locations like traffic islands? And I just wanna quickly say that we are um, working to pursue that idea in Lincoln with the, the roadside um, traffic and safety committee. May have, may have gotten that name mixed up, but maybe Evan, you could speak to the types of plants that might do well in that um, setting. Yeah. A more roadside setting. Yeah, um, we, we did look at that in the Birches School Toolkit, which is the last toolkit in the plan. Um, here it is. This right here, area one, is a truck, is a parking lot island or a traffic island. And this right here, which is area eight, is also one, which is larger. And so you could pull plants from those lists. Um, a lot of them are um, salt tolerant or tolerant of pretty rough conditions. Um, it's got like things like um, meadow willow and shining willow on it, which you may or may not be able to do on some traffic islands. But it's also got, you know, coastal plain Joe pieweed, purple flowering raspberry um, for more shady areas, little blue stem, and coastal plain Joe pie are both salt tolerant, tall white aster, Dolingera umbellata is great. It also has um, the bigger parking lot island, I believe, had um, seaside goldenrod. Um, so these are all really um, tough species. You could include uh, northern bush honeysuckle. Uh, native roses, um, all those species are out there in the toolkit and they're good for um, traffic areas. Mm. Uh, just a quick follow up to that, Evan. Uh, do you think there's any concern about um, bumblebee casualties if they're crossing roads? No. They fly in the air. High enough to, <laughs> I think the real issue, to go over the track. The real issue is pesticides. Mm -hmm. That's what we're, whoops, I turned on my AutoCAD. Hold on a second. Um, let me stop sharing here. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, nothing's perfect, but am I gonna worry about an insect and, and flying and getting hit by a car? No, in fact, I'd like to see more of that in the sense that there's not enough insects out there to even get, you know, squashed on the windshield anymore. You know, when I was, I'm not that young, um, when I was a kid, I see a huge difference. I've been alive for 42 years. And even over the last 30 years, there's a huge difference in the flying biomass that you find on your windshield after a long car ride. So, and there's been studies on that specifically where they've driven holding out a net and they catch almost nothing. So I don't think we should be worried about that. But I do think that chemicals the, the main drivers of insect decline are loss of natural landscapes, insecticides. So you don't wanna plant near a farm that's using pesticides that are widely sprayed. You don't wanna plant near a big ball field where, they, where you know that they're using insecticides or pesticides. If you are near those sorts of areas, there should be at least a hundred feet of forest in between you and them. And when I say 100 feet, I mean wide, uh, which is a buffer. And ideally, that forested buffer would also contain understory plants like shrubs. That is what's going to protect the drift. If you absolutely don't have that option, then you, know, you really have to think carefully about what you're doing because you could be drawing pollinators to your site and then you know, someone comes out there and sprays something and then they're all going to die. 
So talking to your neighbors or trying to find sites that are protected is the first step. All right, I think that makes a great point, Evan, about um, you know, our, our hopes and dreams for connectivity within Lincoln and beyond and how you know, if everybody could go out and convince their neighbors to do this, you could start to build that, that corridor up very, very quickly. Um, so I just wanna pause here for a moment and see if there, have, there are any other questions um, or comments from the audience. Um, Um, okay, great question from Julia um, about how, um, so the, these toolkits are very, very specific to Lincoln and, and New England. Do you have a sense of how um, far they would be applicable before you would need to start shifting the plant list recommendations? Yeah, so I mean, there's sort of like two answers. One answer is, you know, yeah, something's better than nothing. So just to look at it in a very broad term, if you live in the Northeast, and if you live in an area that is, um, you know, low elevation, less than less than 1,000 or even 500 feet above sea level, why don't you pull from these plant um, toolkits and put these plants on your landscape? You can always verify on GoBotany.com if a plant is native to your state or county, if you really want to be specific. Um, but then looking at it more specifically, particularly on the butterfly recommendations, Rob put in a lot of time looking at the flight, the flight times of these species and when they pass through this part of the state. So the recommendations for host plants um, are very specific to those species, first of all, being present in Lincoln at all. Secondly, that they are at risk. So they may not be at risk, for example, in Maine, or they may not be at risk in New Jersey. Um, so you might, you in most cases will be tweaking the list and same with the bees. You're not gonna attract, there's certain bumblebee species that you're never going to attract in Lincoln, but you would have a very easy time attracting them in Western Massachusetts where sites are above, you know, 800 or a thousand square, a thousand feet above sea level, um, like Bumbus tricola. So when we do our design sites in higher elevation areas, we include other bumblebees and sometimes other um, solitary bees in the list and the butterfly species change as well. So you can sort of go about it two ways. If you wanted to just get something going, you know, just go off of this and just verify and go botany, look at bumblebee and butterfly records for your state or for your area and try to do the best job you can with host plants. Um, or you can reach out to us and maybe we can try to help you by doing a project in your area. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Evan, is that the focus, the emphasis is the, the local um, habitat ecology and what the native pollinators are for that specific area. Um, just one final comment from Deborah um, about the, the huge median strips and Hanscom Drive as you head into the Air Force Base and the airport. Um, they're just grass and full sun. And I think she makes a really great suggestion that um, wouldn't it be nice if that was all pollinator habitat. Um, so and, unless we have any other questions, Evan, thank you so much um, for a really engaging program. And I think we've got a lot of people excited to read through the pollinator action plan in, in great detail and um, get excited about planting this spring. Um, and thank you to Rob for, for chiming in on a few uh, specific <laughs> questions as well. Um, so I'm not seeing any further questions, so I will end it here. Thank you all, um, and we'll see you for our next program, hopefully. Good night. Right. Thanks, Bryn, and thanks to LLCT.